Good afternoon and welcome to this very special sessions of the uh, Anesthesia and Analgesia Perioperative Medicine webinar. Um, my name is TJ Gan. I am the executive section editor for Perioperative Medicine section of the uh, ANA. I'm again delighted today that um, uh, we, as you know, uh, recently had a high impact bundle that was published uh, in the um, May issue um, of um, ANA. And uh, we are delighted today to welcome the authors of these um, manuscripts to uh, join us on this very special uh, webinar. And um, so let's go to the next slide, if you would, Tracy. So first of all, um, let me, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I am currently at uh, MD Anderson. Um, I've been there for the last uh, seven, eight months now. And, uh, prior to that, I was at Stony Brook University and chair there for eight years. And before that, I was at Duke University for over 20 years and have been, uh, involved in perioperative medicine uh, research for a number of years and also clinical pharmacology. So I'm really excited that uh, we have this session today. And I'd like to introduce the panelists today, if I can uh, go to the next slide, Tracy, and Dr. Tom Vedder. And as many of you know, Dr. Vedder is the uh, asso assistant uh, editor in chief of ANA. Uh, He's currently the Chief of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine, uh, Professor of Diploma of Surgery, Perioperative Care at Dell Medical School in Austin, uh, not too far from where I am in Houston. Um, and uh, he may be able to join us later on today uh, because he's told me that he's uh, in the pre-op screening, um, a clinical day for him today. But his uh, manuscript uh, that was published in the area was uh, titled Recognizing, Maximizing the Nexus of Parent Medicine and Narrative uh, Medicine, an exciting uh, topic that uh, you will hear from him. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the next uh, panelist, um, Dr. Kamal Maheswari. And Kamal um, is an associate professor of anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic. And um, the article that he wrote was Artificial Intelligence for Perioperative Medicine, uh, Perioperative Intelligence. Uh, next, I will have a pleasure to introduce Dr. Vijay Gautamukala. Uh, Vijay is in the uh, uh, my uh, division in the Department of Anesthesiology at uh, MD Anderson. And uh, Vijay has been um, working for many, many years on uh, enhanced recovery efforts at MD Anderson and has published widely in the area of perioperative medicine. Uh, and the uh, manuscript that we co-wrote uh, in the high impact bundle is perioperative medicine, what the future can hold for anesthesiology uh, looking forward into the future. Uh, next uh, on the panelists, uh, we have uh, Ramani Munish, Munishing, and Ramani is a professor of perioperative medicine at uh, University College London across the pond, and we are delighted to have her join us, um, although over there it's a little bit later, I think it's uh, six hours ahead of the central time. And Ramani is currently at University College London. He's an honorary consultant in anesthesia, University College London Hospital, where I also spent a number of years when I was in the UK. Um, and the article that she wrote was the anesthesiologist as a public health physician. So a very different angle from uh, uh, the traditional paradigm medicine that we, we think about. And so these are the panelists. And so the way that is going to go is that uh, we have a recording of from each of the panelists uh, for about uh, eight to 10 minutes or so. And then we'll play the recording after this introduction. And at any time, if you have any question, uh, you are feel, feel free to uh, put it in the Q&A, uh, not the chat box, but the Q&A 
uh, box and uh, we will take those questions uh, from different panelists as we go along, but also have time at the end of the uh, um, recordings to, uh, uh, to answer any, any questions. So um, anyone, any questions, feel free to put in the Q&A button at us on the Zoom taskbar. Uh, with that, I believe, Tracy, that we will go on to the first um, uh, panelist uh, uh, recording. Hello, my name is Tom Vetter, and I welcome this opportunity to speak with you today about narrative medicine good for your health and good for healthcare. My three presentation objectives today include present the gist of narrative medicine, provide a brief description of a narrative medicine workshop session, and three, convince you that learning about narrative medicine and how to practice it is good for your own health and well-being, plus good for your healthcare system. In his book entitled The Examined Life, Stephen Gross notes about the power of the story. When we cannot find a way of telling our story, our story tells us. We dream these stories, we develop symptoms, or we find ourselves acting in ways we don't understand. I had the opportunity to complete the 15 credit hour Certificate in Professional Achievement in Narrative Medicine at Columbia University. The Columbia University model of narrative medicine has three primary guiding premises. The first, is that contemporary medicine has overemphasized the biomedical and technological aspects of care at the expense of the person-oriented or human side of care. Narrative medicine emphasizes development of a clinician's narrative skills to provide them with the necessary narrative tools and core competencies. And by applying these newly acquired narrative tools and core competencies, clinicians can better understand the patient and thus put themselves in the patient's point of view. So exactly what is narrative medicine? The central tenet, as promulgated by Columbia University and Dr. Rita Sharon, is that attention to narrative, the patient's story, the clinician's story, or more often than not, a story constructed together by the clinician and patient is essential for optimal patient care. This narrative or story contains information needed to treat the individual patient, and attention to this narrative or story can enhance the patient-physician interaction, their relationship, and ultimately, patient outcomes. Narrative competence, the ability to construct, as well as deconstruct or understand stories, is a key element of comprehensive clinical expertise. In some ways, this is revisiting at least for me, and I might suggest for many of you, the primary reasons why we went into medicine, maybe our pre-medical idealistic aspirations. The fundamentals of a narrative medicine skills building workshop session, which is very experiential in nature, are three basic concepts. The first is attention. This includes or involves the close reading of a piece of literary text, a short piece of prose, a poem, perhaps part of a script, a short segment of a film, a piece of visual art, like a painting, a piece of dance or music. This is followed by close observation and attentive discussion of its details, specific details, noting its perspective, describing its form, hearing its voice and sensing its motion and mood. This then segues into representation where the workshop facilitator poses a series of questions and facilitates discussion among the narrative medicine session or workshop participants. This leads to a short open-ended writing prompt related to the subject of the chosen piece. Workshop participants are then encouraged for three to five minutes, no more, to write briefly in response spontaneously to that writing prompt with no attention to grammar or spelling or diction or syntax, just write what comes to one's mind and one's heart. This then leads to the third concept of affiliation. Through the efforts of the workshop facilitator, but actually the workshop participants themselves, there's a naturally developing 
narrative medicine affiliation um, among the workshop participants when they share their prompted writing, if they're so inclined and feel comfortable doing so. And thus they come in closer contact and form a connection with one another. This is especially true when there are a series of workshop sessions held over say a four to five or six week time period. I was fortunate enough to write this article recognizing and maximizing the nexus of perioperative medicine and narrative medicine in the recent ANA high impact bundle. In it, I revisited a subset of four inter interdependent goals of an integrated model of perioperative medicine and perioperative care. These four goals include enhancing patient-centered care, embracing shared decision-making, optimizing health literacy, and avoiding futile surgery. I propose in this paper that applying narrative medicine in the perioperative medicine and care space can help us to achieve these four interdependent goals. Again, enhancing patient-centered care, embracing shared decision-making, optimizing health literacy, and avoiding futile surgery. Specifically, applying Rita Sharon's and Columbia University's model of narrative medicine in the care of the surgical patient can facilitate achieving this same subset of four still currently very relevant interdependent goals of perioperative medicine. We are all very familiar with the IHI triple aim. It includes improving the patient experience of care, including quality and patient satisfaction. Two, improving the health of populations in our world, the surgical population. And three, reducing per capita cost of health care. Over the last 10 to 15 years, the triple aim has evolved into the quadruple aim with a recognition that the care of the patient requires care of the clinician. We are all very familiar and experience firsthand the ever increasing, ever rising societal and patients and families expectations of clinicians and their healthcare practices. We also are all very aware, sometimes painfully aware, of the wide gap that exists between these rising societal and patient and family expectations and the realities of the practice of medicine and healthcare. This leads to clinician job dissatisfaction, disaffection, compassion fatigue, burnout, and actually, unfortunately, a number of clinicians are leaving the practice of medicine and healthcare. One physician is quoted as saying, I'm no longer a physician, but the data manager, data entry clerk. I became a doctor to take care of patients. I now have become the typist. One healthcare executive noted, we have adopted the triple aim as our framework but the stressful work life of our clinicians and staff impacts our ability to achieve the three aims. This was written in 2014. And I'm sure we can appreciate that given the COVID-19 pandemic and the post-pandemic scourge that continues, this is particularly true and unfortunately very heightened. Therefore, the well-being of the entire patient care team is a prerequisite for successfully achieving and sustaining the triple aim. This has led once again to the quadruple aim, which is comprised of the patient experience, optimizing population health, reducing cost, and equally optimizing care team well being. As other authors have pointed out, and I specifically translated this to the applicability of narrative medicine, I believe that narrative medicine fosters achieving aim number one, optimizing the patient experience, but also can help us in achieving aim number four which is sustaining, maintaining care team well-being. My concluding observations come from Dr. Rita Sharon, who holds an MD and a PhD in English literature. She was the founder of perioperative, excuse me, of narrative medicine as we know it here in the United States and in many places elsewhere in the world. Dr. Sharon noted in 2017, quote, these are diverse people who come to us. They say, I've been practicing narrative medicine for years. I just didn't know there was a name for it. That includes myself. And they come, patients come, families come. So it feels like we've opened something. I love this photograph as a photographer myself, entitled Arlington Bluebell Walk by Paul Lloyd. It's such a beautiful scene. It reminds me of the Texas blue bonnets that were in bloom here in Austin just last month in April. Dr. Sharon goes on to note a metaphor we often use is we've created a clearing, you know, like in the middle of the forest. Again, I'm drawn to this photo to the right, a clearing that offers some safety, some protection. 
And I would suggest that that safety and protection applies to not only our families, their patient, our patients, their families, but if we're receptive and so inclined to all of us as clinicians. Thank you for your time and attention. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, ANA and the editorial team uh, for the invitation to share the thoughts on perioperative intelligence. Uh, today, I'll be talking about artificial intelligence for perioperative medicine. Um, AI, after the launch of ChatGPT, is very much in vogue, and a um, lot of people, or almost every field, is looking into how they can benefit from AI. We recently wrote a paper on um, in ANA. It's published in the, uh, early this year, and the idea was to give an give an overview that how artificial intelligence can be used in perioperative medicine. So first, whenever we think about artificial intelligence, we think it is a very complex formula of things, and that it cannot be understood. Uh, but at the at the very basic, artificial intelligence is a science which is dedicated to develop systems and methods which mim mimics human intelligence. That's a very basic thing. And then within the artificial intelligence, a um, lot of different terms which we have heard, machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing. So these are the different ways in which you can generate information uh, from data, different type of data, and gather insights. Um, towards in gaining human intelligence. Um, so for example, deep learning and natural language processing is an integral part of uh, chat GPT type of technologies, uh, which are language models. So overall, artificial intelligence is a goal, right? And how you, how you achieve this goal is from hundreds of different methods uh, which, are, which are available right now. How does it apply into uh, perioperative medicine? So perioperative medicine is very complex. Um, and anesthesia, anesthesiologists lead uh, the whole spectrum of perioperative care, be it the preoperative uh, phase, intraoperative phase, postoperative phase, and long-term recovery. And this is well-defined within, as per the ASA, a perioperative surgical home model. But if you look closely into it, uh, when we talk about, for example, preoperative um, phase, um, you have to engage with the patients. You have to assess and triage, that is risk stratification. You have to optimize patient's care, evidence-based protocol. But all these things seems abstract until you have a defined algorithms, which can guide which evidence-based protocol will be used for a particular patient. That's why this overall idea was a good idea, but it was to deploy this thing, to implement this idea of perioperative surgical home or the whole perioperative care, you need technology. And artificial intelligence would be the key driver here to help in the perioperative care. Um, the basic data collection analysis and reporting or dashboarding is the very start of it. But once you gather insights and you use at the time of decision-making, that's what uh, artificial intelligence as a, as a technology uh, will be very beneficial. And uh, uh, my goal was is to try to give you some brief examples of how it's going to help. So one of the ways which in, in our paper, which we highlighted um, the idea of perioperative intelligence, we simplified that at least the early adoption of artificial intelligence should be at the level of identification of at-risk patient, that means the risk stratification, that's a low-hanging fruit. Once you identify the patients who are at risk, you, you, you identify if their care is going um, away from the norm, that, that means in, if they are developing any complications. And early detection of complications is another key area. And the timely and effective treatment is that once the complications are detected, um, how do you treat them? How you detect them uh, in a timely fashion for an effective treatment? That is another key area. And this whole thing is going to only happen with the collaboration uh, of healthcare providers, systems, data scientists, 
medical technology will be the, well, and artificial intelligence will be the key key area here. Just to give you an example, but if we want to optimize um, hemodynamic state or physiological state of a particular person in the intraoperative phase, we will develop a prediction model that when the the hemodynamic state was going to go good bad, um, you have to have an early diagnosis and then appropriate treatment for that. Um, there'll be an algorithm which in which it'll take some data from physiological monitors um, and it's going to output will be a prediction of yes or no of any uh, hemodynamic aberration. And it will tell you a physiological state that if it is uh, a state in which it's a, it's a preload uh, optimization is needed or offload optimization is needed. Um, and once you know that, then you can suggest an intervention that, okay, if the patient is preload optimization is needed, please just give fluid. And th that becomes the, flow, the whole loop of um, an AI-based system uh, of optimizing physiological state. Building algorithms of AI algorithms should have three strong components. One is the algorithms should be robust. Robust means that they should uh, they should perform well in the performance metrics, and they should be validated in not only uh, a native data set but an external data set. So, so, so that's what it's means by robust algorithms. Once you have a very good algorithm and doing whatever outcome you want to uh, achieve, uh, it should be the outcomes which it changes should be clinically meaningful um, to the patients, uh, you know, in, in the in the care of the patient. So that has to be a key component of any AI-based system that it is changing some clinically meaningful outcome. And third, I would not say the most important, but the equally important is the strong business case because all everything cost money. And in the hospital system, given that we are spending so much of money, um, any interventions which you do, any system, new system you should place should have a strong business case. Otherwise, if, even if it is a robust algorithm, it changes clinical meaningful outcomes, it will be very difficult to deploy in the hospital settings. Um, anesthesia closed loop systems, uh, which are there on horizon for the last many decades, uh, will be possible with the use of AI technology um, in which the, the different columns which uh, are, are listed here is that the, you have to identify the goal. The goal is analgesia or hypnosis or muscle relaxation. If, and for every goal, there, there will be a sensor, that what type of sensor you're using, some kind of controller, what are you controlling, and which is an algorithm um, which is built in there and then how are you going to deliver the intervention uh, that will be uh, that'll be a part of anesthesia closed loop system and they are more of a reality now than it is in the past few decades another application of the ai is in the area of research um, the research efficiency can be improved um, especially with the screening um, deployment of research interventions novel research designs and also uh, automated outcome assessment, which, so the whole research can be more efficient uh, with the use of AI technologies. Quality improvement programs in which we develop um, pathways for cons develop, uh, deploying consistent care um, can be efficiently uh, deployed with the AI-based technologies. OR management, we already see some usage um, of um, rule-based systems in operating room management. But with the, with the real-time data coming out of the operating rooms, um, you, you can make a very efficient uh, changes um, in the operating room management. Workforce changes, which, which, is, which is imminent. And this is one, one of the things with the AI technology, everybody's talking about people, jobs will change, people's jobs profile will change, and it will happen in perioperative medicine. The type of people, uh, their credentials, who are doing what, will change uh, because now you have decision support system, you have closed loop systems, and um, that they will have a huge impact um, in, in our field. Novel surgical technologies will make uh, like 3D uh, surgical techniques, robotic surgical techniques will make surgery safer and will bring new type of surgeries into, into the market. And that'll be a part of the, uh, this AI revolution. 
The limitation in general um, for AI is well known. Now everybody knows uh, that we have to ensure that AI systems are generalizable. Um, you know, we, we have talked about equitable healthcare. We, you know, and and the and to to give an equitable healthcare, that any solution which is built should be applied in small, medium, large hospital setting or any community. Um, and the problems with this is that we currently have a biased data and biased algorithms, and that needs to be improved. Implementation barriers are, are huge. Uh, even if you have a best AI solution, when you implement in a clinical practice, it, it, might, um, it might be adopted in a different fashion in different settings. And that is an altogether different science. Uh, and implementation uh, needs to be studied very closely. And cost, uh, right now to build uh, AI algorithms or AI solutions is costly. And also the regulatory barriers. We don't know how to handle uh, different technology, um, who's gonna be held responsible, who's gonna have the patents, uh, if, who's over building the technologies. A lot of these limitations are slowing the development of AI, especially in healthcare. Our recommendations um, in, in our paper, we, we said, uh, that if education and artificial intelligence technology should be integral part of now our curriculum. Um, so that's one, you know, as, as we are um, teaching our residents, medical students, or in general, artificial intelligence education has to be integral part. That how you develop the solution, what is, how the problem solving happen in AI solutions, um, that education has to start early. It has to be done with collaboration. Uh, one physician, or one anesthesiologist cannot uh, do everything, even if it's the best idea. Um, the collaboration with technologists, uh, with the patients, with the rest of the team members, with data scientists is, is the key. Data access um, and safety um, uh, is, is paramount. And how you make it happen within uh, healthcare systems with leadership um, and between uh, within organization and outside organization is is also a paramount. As I talked about, because of the algorithmic bias, uh, the algorithm development and validation, um, both internal and external validation, have to be the key. Implementation science will has to um, get in place, um, and the regulatory changes which can which can allow these uh, adoption of AI technologies um, has to be made. So um, a, a lot of new changes, new technologies are about to happen, more so after the rollout of a large language model like ChatGPT, and we have seen how they are already changing um, within the last few months, uh, a lot of different fields. So brace yourself, a huge change is coming. Thank you. Welcome to the IARS webinar series on perioperative medicine high impact bundle. My name is Vijaya Gottumakala. I'm a professor of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. I'm a consultant for Massimo. However, my presentation today will not discuss any investigational or off label use of medications. The topic I would be discussing today with you is perioperative medicine, what the future can hold for anesthesiology. We as a specialty have made tremendous progress in enhancing safety and quality of our patients. And this has been done through a systemic study into the anesthetic related mortality, adoption of technologies into clinical practice to enhance safety for our patients, creating anesthesia patient safety foundation and adoption of basic standards for general anesthesia. And as a result, the direct anesthetic related mortality has seen a significant reduction over the years. However, with the changing demographics of our patients and more and more complex surgeries being undertaken by our surgical colleagues, there continues to be an increased post-operative morbidity 
and mortality, particularly in the elderly aged group of our patient population. If you look at the global leading causes of death, first and foremost is cardiovascular diseases followed by cancer. However, if you look into 30-day postoperative mortality, the annually it's estimated that there are 4.2 million deaths related to 30-day postoperative mortality, and this makes it the third leading cause of death globally. We have risen to the challenge as a specialty, realizing that to decrease perioperative mortality, we have to initiate strategies along the entire surgical journey of our patients, starting in the preoperative period, in the intraoperative period, and extending these pathways of care strategies into the postoperative and post-discharge phases as well. As a result, working with our surgical colleagues, we have embarked on enhanced recovery programs. And in the US, we have also started the perioperative surgical home. So together, we have seen a tremendous reduction in opioid use in the perioperative period, reduction in GI-related complications, reduction in length of stay with no change in readmissions. That's all commendable. But in 2023 and looking forward, what are we going to be facing in terms of the demands and challenges are to do with supply demand of qualified and trained anesthesia personnel and meeting the challenges posed by disruptors in healthcare delivery. The Lancet Commission on Global Surgery was published in 2015, and it highlighted the terrific gaps in the demand and supply of quality surgical, obstetric, and anesthetic care, the continuing need to provide safe access, which is affordable to most of the patient population, and providing that safe quality care. It's estimated that over 5 billion of world's population today are without access to safe and affordable surgical care. We still need about 143 million operations as the unmet gap. We need to put in about $350 billion to meet those demands. And if we don't act today, we are going to incur a loss of about $23 trillion. So a tremendous opportunity gap lies ahead for us to meet the surgical demands and needs. In addition, we will be faced with the disruptors in healthcare delivery, which range from consumerism, the Amazon effect, the regulatory changes and burdens that come, but most importantly, the digital revolution, including the AI and its impact on healthcare. So why and how is this related to perioperative medicine? What you and I and our colleagues all over the world do in the realm of periprocedural and perioperative care, including obstetric care, is tremendous. It's estimated that globally, the surgical causes contribute to a 30% of global burden of disease. Of all the in-hospital admissions worldwide, again, surgical causes contribute about 50%. Annually, there are 310 million surgical procedures which are done worldwide. So we have a tremendous role to play in enhancing quality and safety of perioperative care, improving population health, controlling the cost of healthcare delivery. As you all know, currently in the US, healthcare delivery costs about 19% of our GDP. So how do we move ahead addressing these challenges? Is to build on the excellent foundation we've already laid so far in making anesthesiology and perioperative medicine as a beacon of patient safety and improving quality and our colleagues as leaders in the perioperative and periprocedural space. So building on that, 
the foundation. We have to build coalitions with our professional, other professional societies. We have to expand our scope of practice and influence not only in the peri procedural and perioperative area, but also in the population health realm. We have to do this by evaluating and impacting social determinants of health and health disparities in medical care. We have to develop our specialty and perioperative medicine as a learning health system program. And we also have to work with our payers and regulatory agencies to develop a mechanism for fair, transparent, and just reimbursement system. So the tenants of the learning healthcare system are already there and what we've been doing, which includes science, collaboration, change management, culture, adopting informatics, and the digital revolution. So quite a few institutions have started fellowship programs in perioperative medicine and with the dedication, commitment, and passion of our influential leaders in the field. And each one of you working in this area, I have no doubt that the future is bright for us. I would encourage all of you, if you already haven't read, to go through the various articles in the perioperative medicine high impact bundle of anesthesia analgesia, and I'm looking forward to an engaging discussion this afternoon. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Ramani Munasinger. Uh, I'm a clinician based in London uh, in the United Kingdom, and I'm really grateful to uh, Anesthesia and Analgesia for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about my open mind uh, article, The Anesthesiologist as Public Health Physician. I'm also particularly grateful to uh, TJ Gann for giving me the opportunity to write the article. So um, public health defined by the uh, CDC in the United States says that it is the science of protecting and improving the health of people in their communities. This work is achieved by promoting healthy lifestyles, researching disease and injury prevention, and detecting, preventing and responding to infectious diseases. And I put it to you that apart from perhaps the infectious diseases bit at the end, that is absolutely a core role of the anesthesiologist uh, going forward. And why do I say that? Well, this is the beginnings of our profession. Uh, this, the uh, representation of the first anaesthetic given in England, uh, a few months after the first anaesthetic given in the world uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, the blue plaque there represents the site in the hospital that I work in, uh, where that anaesthetic was given in 1846. And on the right hand side, the apparatus used uh, for inhaling ether in the early days in the 1840s. Now, you could say that the early goals of anaesthesia care were simply to keep patients alive and uh, if possible to alleviate short-term pain. And underneath the Latin there is the uh, logo of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, of which I'm a fellow, Divinum Sedare Dolorum, or it is a divine to alleviate pain. Now we've moved on a bit since then, and we now have uh, complex monitors, complex me methods of administering anaesthesia, loads of different ways of doing it, and masses and masses of safety put around the delivery of perioperative care in the operating theatre. This study, which, which was conducted 10 years ago, found that intraoperative uh, mortality of surgery undertaken during a snapshot audit in 2013 of only 0.06%. And the majority of those deaths would have been due to not necessarily anaesthesia related problems, but for example, a severe unmanageable blood loss in the case of uh, a major trauma, for example. So we've moved from the early days of anaesthesia to a period uh, now which we are in where the intraoperative delivery of anaesthesia is largely very safe. And while there are patient safety challenges around, for example, rare but potentially catastrophic events such as anaphylaxis, cardiac arrest, accidental awareness, and there are, of course, problems around things like maintenance of blood pressure within defined limits and so on, largely intraoperative anaesthesia has become a relatively safe endeavour. However, that doesn't fully reflect the impact of anesthesiology care or anesthesia care. So it's estimated that there are more than 300, uh, more than 300 million operations taking place worldwide. 
uh, at least five million procedures that can be classed as surgery in the per year in the United Kingdom, where I am based, around 1.7 million major surgical operations in the UK per year, with roughly, approximately at population level, a 1% mortality for elective surgery and a 10% mortality for emergency surgery, such as emergency laparotomies. That's at 30 days. However, the impact of morbidity is much more significant. So a much, much higher proportion of patients experience major complications. And we know from work first done in the United States using the NISQIP program uh, that post-operative complications have long-term impact. So they're associated with reduced uh, long-term health-related quality of life. They're even reduced with redu associated with reduced long-term survival. That's been demonstrated to be independent of preoperative risk factors such as heart disease and lung disease. So the reach of postoperative complications is 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 far, and complications have an impact far outlasting the overt resolution of the complication in front of you. And we have this additional challenge of this these two worlds colliding. First, the general state of the condition of the patients we look after. They're getting older. They're getting frailer. They're getting more multimorbid. And then secondly, the advancement of technology associated with surgery, robotic surgery, better anaesthetic techniques. All of these things means that surgery is available to more people, which is generally a great thing. But it means that the impact of complications is even more significant as we undertake to do more and more work. The scale of the problem. Well, US citizens undergo an average of 9.2 procedures in their lifetime. 7.4% of elective and 20% of emergency surgical patients over the age of 65 are estimated to die within a year of their surgery. And in the United Kingdom, where I'm based, if current trends persist, one in five adults over the age of 75 will have surgery each year. So that's a massive, massive burden of surgery. So the anaesthetists or the anesthesiologists of today, yes, we have to keep them alive and alleviate short term pain. But our job also has to be about reducing complications, limiting avoidable harm and improving long-term outcome. And the goals of achieving this have to start before the day of surgery. If you look here at the global burden of disease, this taken from 2015, you see that these major risks, dietary risks, high blood pressure, tobacco smoking, high, blood, high body mass index, and so on and so forth, all of these risk factors, all of these big hitting globally massive uh, diseases, are also risk factors for poor surgical outcome as well as for poor life outcomes. And that's the bottom line is that perioperative care is about public health because things which are bad for surgery are bad for life. So the solutions for life, one might consider to be the public health solutions, are the same as the solutions for perioperative care, which you might consider to be our domain as an anesthesiologist. We need to address physical and psychological comorbidities we need to address the health literacy gap and reduce health inequalities. And this isn't about us saying no to patients coming for surgery. It's about saying, how can we help to our customers? It's about addressing the teachable moment, using the opportunity of the preoperative pathway to help patients overcome their long-term health conditions and challenges. And it's about working together with, with patients and with our other colleagues to address the tricky challenges in healthcare frailty, multimorbidity, polypharmacy, and on the other end of the spectrum in children, the detection of major risks such as school absenteeism and child abuse. So perioperative care in 2023 should be around also addressing health inequalities, both behavioural challenges which we know are more prevalent in deprived populations such as smoking, excess of alcohol intake and other risky behaviours, and also the more generic structural challenges that we have around inequality, inequality of outcome for people who are deprived and for people of cer certain racial and ethnic backgrounds. So time and time again, we demonstrate the problem, not just in surgery, but in public health more generally, that patients who are deprived and patients from certain racial and ethnic groups have worse outcomes. But the question that I pose to you is who is developing the solutions? We know that health inequalities are largely down to structural inequalities in society, poor housing, lack of opportunity, lack of access to jobs, poverty. However, in the perioptive pathway, I would put it to you that we have a specific opportunity to develop solutions that are tailored to patients having surgery, because we're all gonna grow old and die before we develop the solutions, before the governments all develop the solutions for the major challenges. So let's focus on our area and see what we can do better. So my pitch to you 
is that yes of course we still have a job to do in the operating room we still have a job to do to keep patients safe keep them alive alleviate pain and reduce the risk of short-term harm after surgery but the scale of the public health challenge i would put to you is much much greater so let's apply ourselves as anesthesiologists to the bigger picture Let's detect patient risk factors as early as possible in perioptive pathways. Let's optimise our patients prior to surgery. Let's focus on addressing health inequalities where we can in perioptive pathways and hope that that has lasting impact on the wider, peri on the wider public health agenda. And let's focus on the prevention agenda, not just through managing conditions such as hypertension, diabetes and so on in perioptive pathways but also addressing the long-term impact that post-operative complications have on patient health by reducing those complications in the first place. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your discussion. discussion. Thank you um, for all our panelists for that uh, wonderful synopsis of the articles in the high impact uh, bundle. Um, I now welcome back our panelists um, to the uh, audience uh, here. So um, for those of you who want to ask a question, feel free to uh, put it in the Q&A box. Uh, I see that there is a question in there that I'm going to start with. Uh, please feel free to uh, put those questions that you may have uh, for our panelists for discussion. So the first question, um, is according to WHO statistics, over 5 billion people worldwide lack access to safe surgery and anesthesia. Question is, can AI help us to resolve this in any way? And I think I'm going to call on Dr. Maheswari to uh, take that on first and, of course, um, followed by the other panelists for their view. Come on. Yeah, um, so that's a very good question. And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. Uh, the, the impact of artificial intelligence, if we talk about the intraoperative care and the perioperative care, right? So intraoperative care, as the data was presented in the previous presentation, but it's, it has become very safe. So whenever a system becomes very safe, right, then it is ready for automation. And that's what happened in the last, you know, how the technology and how humanity progresses. And we know that uh, with, with the power of both the sensors, technology, and algorithms, we will be able to convert our, uh, the, the intraoperative care to be a stable uh, system in which AI will be able to build uh, both analgesic, hypnotic, muscle relaxation, and all this stuff can be automated. And once you automate and you go to mass scale, they can be deployed uh, at, at a very wide, range of uh, places. So that's the one way in which I think that intraoperative care will be safe um, with AI at every level. You will be able to provide the care which TJ Gann provides in his hospital to any remote place in the world. So I, I think that uh, that's very possible and that's the goal actually. Thank you, Kamal. And I see question coming in. We actually have someone from Cameroon. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, joining us. Um, the next question from uh, Tariq Malik. What is the incentive in the current health system in the US not to operate till they are optimized preoperatively? Um, the stress is on keep going surgery until since the complications are manageable. Um, thoughts? Um, maybe I'll start off with uh, Vijay and uh, come to other panelists. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you, TJ. Um, unfortunately, the payment system in the US, although changing, currently is procedural based. And you're absolutely right. If we have our view as very short term and just looking at intraoperative complications, yes, we as anesthesiologists have become very good at managing them. But as Ramani had said, and I had presented, the challenge and the issue is not intraoperative complications. It's the 30-day post-operative complications. It's to back to recovery, back to home, back to self, back to work. That's where we are losing sight of where the real challenge is and how do we invest. So it takes a big effort. It takes change in healthcare policy. 
that is where the learning healthcare system comes, which is improvement in care and innovation to meet the, the needs and requirements of all stakeholders. That is the patients, the payers, the government, the regulatory agencies. We have a long way ahead, but I'm absolutely positive that the future is bright with constant engagement from our leaders in the society, in our professional society. Well, um, Kamal, do you want to have, uh, since you're talking about health system in the US, do you want to uh, weigh in on this? Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, the major uh, change which will happen and which is already happening to some extent is the health maintenance organizations, uh, which is a shift from a value-based, uh, this uh, fee-for-service to the value-based care. Um, you know, it's every, every year we talk about it and we go closer to that goal. It, it doesn't happen. It's a generational change. Um, there are examples of a system in the United States which are working at that level, which is Kaiser. Um, and you, at, at Kaiser Health System, which is now the biggest health system in the United States and in the nonprofit world, um, there's, I would not say there's no rush for or no stacking up the OR, but they do do care about that giving the, if the patient will need surgery, why the patient needs surgery, how you can optimize the whole perioperative care because they're maintaining the whole individual and the, they have to kind of cut the, manage the cost of the whole uh, individual throughout. So yes, I mean, that's the solution. Um, we have to move that way. Great, so I think the next question is for uh, Dr. Munishinga. Um, Pramani said the question is that, uh, who are involved in a pre-op clinic at UCL? Is it still an anesthetic only area or is it multidisciplinary? So it, uh, thanks, great question. So uh, it's becoming more multidisciplinary. Uh, we have a specialist clinic for older patients who have complex problems, which is run jointly between um, an anesthesiologist and a geriatrician. Uh, where our pathways work best is in particular uh, surgical specialties where there is a truly multidisciplinary effort. So at the time that the consideration is being made of treatment options for a patient, whether it be surgery or anything else, the anesthesiologist is involved in those conversations, as well as the surgeon, the physician, the oncologist, whatever. Um, where that works really well in our pathways is, is weight loss reduction surgery, actually bariatric surgery, uh, which where it's routine, increasingly it's routine in cancer surgery. So yeah, it's becoming much more multidisciplinary and importantly then the pathways out of our pre-op assessment services are becoming clearer. So where I see a patient who's got some, for example, um, multimorbidity or frailty issues, I might ask my geriatrician colleague to, to review that patient for me in a rapid way and get those pathways really well established. Because we can't necessarily be experts in everything, but what we have to understand is when and how patients need to be triaged to a appropriate specialist input. Yeah, I think uh, you know increasingly many hospitals uh, have integrate other specialty into the whole perioperative process. I know that you know certainly Vanderbilt, Duke, and at MD Anderson, Within our poem clinic, uh, we have cardiologists and internal medicine just next down the corridor. So it makes it much easier to refer patients to, you know, cardiology consult or internal medicine consult without having to go to another, you know, location for the patients. I think the the big change in the NHS TJ is that or in the in the UK National Health Service is that we're trying to move all of this further up the pathway. So at the point that the surgeon is considering whether surgery or not is the right idea, we screen patients um, so that we pick up any health challenges right there at the beginning of the pathway, and then we deal with them. Rather than the system that we've had traditionally where the patient gets listed for surgery, they get a date for the operation, and then they come to the pre-op assessment clinic, by which time there's an, uh, there's, everyone's hopes are raised that the surgery is going to happen and it starts to become quite challenging to manage conditions that haven't been optimally managed before. So just we're trying to re-engineer the way that the pre-op pathway works. Um, and that's now official national policy for us. Yeah, that's uh, great to hear. You know, to extend this question about providing a comprehensive heroic medicine practice 
you know, as one of the question here from uh, Ryan Lesh is that it's expensive and hospital is reluctant to pay for it, um, you know, until you really show the real evidence. So the question is that can AI provide some solutions, um, whether it's algorithm based or, you know, commercially available um, um, software thoughts? Come on first. Yeah, so with regards to the AI, it's, it's a very general term. And so whenever we, we, we are talking about artificial intelligence, it's like any, any problem which we have solved with high quality research and brainstorming, right? And once it's get to a, a level in which um, a, a system is based and you want to deploy it, AI will be valuable. And in this way, you know, the complexity of the perioperative care picking up right pathway, which goes where, um, and those are the areas which will be right for uh, use of technology, especially the AI, because uh, you now have data also at the same time, and not only data about the about the patient records, but also how the patient is going. You know, hospitals are using patient navigation systems and everything, um, where the patient is located, and and so on and so forth. And I totally agree. The care has to start a year before. So even predicting which patient will require surgery is a huge help to a health system in which if I think a patient is going to likely to have a hip replacement in the next one year, then you can get him to a pathway sooner than later rather than when he gets listed for the surgery. So uh, I think the impact will be huge. And it, it, you can think about any problem which in which we are using human intelligence to solve and you add a little bit of data and algorithm, you'll be able to solve with the AI. And that's the value. Great, thanks, Kamal. You know, there are a couple other questions about using AI and how to reduce costs. And I think you sort of touched uh, uh, on that. Um, just moving down, I think we got maybe another couple of questions. Um, Deborah Pooley asked that how do anesthesiologists, as opposed to just surgeon, get access to 30 days post-op complication in order to reduce the rate of complications? Any thoughts? DJ, and I think we do have data. I think the question is really um, getting the hospital to, uh, you know, be, make those data available. Uh, obviously, you know, 30 days post-op complications, some of them when they are outside the hospital is more difficult to get, but certainly like Nisquid do collect uh, sort of 30 days uh, complications, but perhaps, you know, Nationally, I don't know whether in the UK, is there a sort of national database collect 30 days post-op complication data? There, there are, if I may step in TJ, there are for some procedures, um, but it's not universal and we're working on that. So we have, for example, for emergency laparotomy, for hip fracture surgery, for major cancer surgery in most specialties, we have national audits which uh, report risk-adjusted data back to hospitals. They don't all necessarily report it back as frequently as we would like to see kind of continuous quality improvement, but they do it at least on a sort of quarterly basis. And um, that uh, reporting goes back to surgeons and anesthesiologists and other members of the team. What is then done with that information at local level, of course, is very variable. Um, but there is, a, you know, absolutely the data are key to driving change and improvement. Um, so yeah, we do have those structures. Yeah, I think there are a lot of questions here. Again, unfortunately, we are running a little bit out of time, uh, but I would, uh, I think we will try and collect these questions and then to, uh, our panelists to uh, respond back if we have a uh, way to identify some information. I see some of my Colleagues, uh, Ken Spires on, on the line and uh, Karthik from my good old friend from Duke. So, Irene Osborne. So, there are lots of lots of questions here. Um, but I would like to, uh, before we leave, thank for all of you to join us uh, this afternoon. I certainly want to thank the panelists, uh, Dr. Dr. Mukala, Dr. Munishinga, Dr. Maheshwari. Uh, to join us. Dr. Veda, unfortunately, can't join us this afternoon. Uh, and also for our IRS staff for uh, uh, helping us organize this event. 
And with that, I want to thank uh, all the audience for being able to join us. And uh, thank you again for the panelists for uh, your wonderful synopsis and also contribution to the High Impact Bundle. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.